Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at SAMHSA's Gain Center. This is our first of two webinars this month, and uh, this time we're focusing on housing as a critical component of reentry. And I'm Melissa Neal, uh, Senior Research Associate at Policy Research Associates and the, the Gain Center, and I'm just providing a few housekeeping remarks. The first of which, uh, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And throughout the presentation, we welcome questions. Um, you will see on the right side of your screen, there's a Q&A pod. Throughout the presentations, we welcome any questions you may have. And at the end of the presentations, we will be um, walking through as many of those questions as we can with our presenters. You'll also notice on the right side of the screen, we have a couple of polls open for you. And we really welcome your participation in those as you know, it, it will help us understand who all has joined us today and, uh, and, and better understand our audience as we present this information. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. And so we have a great agenda for you today. We are excited to present three uh, presentations on programs that are addressing housing uh, for people who are reentering the community from prisons and jails. And each of these programs is approaching housing from a, a different perspective and a different approach. So we're really hoping that you all will walk away with some different ideas and uh, different perspectives in terms of how to address housing in your communities. But first, we're really excited to have John Berg with us here from Mental Health Services Administration, and he's going to be providing some opening remarks. John? Thank you, Dr. Neal. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on housing as a critical component of reentry. We appreciate you taking the time to participate in today's informative webinar. SAMHSA promotes early intervention and treatment as healthier alternatives to detaining people with behavior health conditions in the U.S. justice systems. However, many individuals that come in contact with the criminal justice system have substance use disorders and or mental health issues. We have many grant programs that support diversion from the criminal justice system, incarceration, and that provide assistance for those in the criminal justice system reentering the community. Upon release from incarceration, whether through a drug court or a reentry program, individuals with behavioral health issues face many barriers to successful reentry into the community, such as lack of health care, job skills, education, and stable housing, which may jeopardize their recovery and increase their probability of relapse and rearrest. Housing is a critical issue that is always identified as one of the most pressing barriers to successful reentry. Housing stability can affect the pro prospect of employment, access to services, and other factors that lead to improved outcomes. This webinar will provide information regarding promising reentry programs that highlight the importance of housing access when working, working with the justice involved individuals reentering their communities. I want to thank Dr. Neal and the Gaines Center staff for hosting this webinar. We are excited for today's webinar to present on the important issue of reentry and housing. We are pleased to have five very distinguished presenters today to inform us with their expertise about this topic. At this time, I will turn it back to Dr. Neal. Thank you so much, John. All right, so I, I'm going to briefly introduce our five panelists today. Um, so first, from Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers, we have Laura Buckley, who is the Senior Program Manager, and she leads a team working on innovative pilots for specific populations within the field of complex care. And she oversees four uh, community-based pro programs, a Housing First Demonstration Project, Camden Reset, which she will share more about in a few minutes, uh, Camden Delivers, and Medical Legal Partnership. Next slide. With her is uh, her colleague, Brandon Goldborn, who is a member of the Innovation Operations Care Team that serves individuals enrolled in the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers Community-Based Outreach Programs. And he serves as an advocate and resource specialist and assists with care coordination from both the Jail Reentry Program and a Maternal Health Addiction Program. Next slide. 
from Homecoming Project, we have Tara Lawyer, who is a project coordinator, and she will be sharing more about the Homecoming Project. Um, she comes with lived experience of incarceration, and so she brings that expertise and is an, ex an advocate for incarcerated people for more than a decade as a peer health educator, a certified drug and alcohol counselor, and a youth diversion specialist. And she has served in numerous capacities uh, and is a spokeswoman for the Drop the Life Without Possibility of Parole campaign and is a next fellow, a next generation fellow at the Center of Juvenile and Criminal Justice. And she's also been involved in developing numerous curricula for therapeutic workshops and groups uh, for people in California state prisons. Next slide. From the Mental Health Association of Nebraska, we have Destiny Camuso, who is a certified peer support and wellness specialist with MHA for almost 10 years. And she's the reentry coordinator for the Mental Health Association of Nebraska and oversees program activities inside prisons as well as the community. And she's the program coordinator for their Hanu Home and Kia House, both of which she and her colleague will share more information about later. With her is Casey Moyer, who's the executive director of the Mental Health Association of Nebraska. And she assisted in the development and implementation of the first state-funded peer-directed programs in Nebraska, the HOPE program, Kia House, and Law Enforcement Referral Program. And she has worked with the Nebraska State Department of Corrections, Nebraska Parole Administration, and Nebraska State Probation to develop and implement peer-operated reentry services. She was appointed member of the Restricted Housing Work group and serves on the National Association of Case Managers Board of Directors. And so with that, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Laura and Brandon to start us off with their presentation. Hi, good morning everyone or afternoon depending on where you're calling in from. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Both Brandon and I are really excited to be here. So uh, before we jump into our jail-based reentry work, we'll just explain a little bit about uh, who the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers is. And our, we are located here in Camden, New Jersey, and our vision is a transformed healthcare system that ensures every individual receives whole person care rooted, rooted in authentic healing relationships with a mission to spark a field and movement that unites communities of caregivers here in Camden and across the nation to improve the well-being of individuals with complex health and social needs. Uh, so in Camden and across the country, a small number of outlier individuals account for a disproportionate amount of healthcare costs and utilization. Healthcare hotspotting is the strategic use of data to target evidence-based services to complex patients with high utilization. And these patients are experiencing a mismatch between their needs and the services available. And so we'll talk today about how we use this healthcare hotspotting model to identify and serve individuals who had a high use of both the healthcare system and the criminal justice system here in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, the Camden Coalition has several programs, both at the patient-facing level and at the systems engagement level. Our traditional healthcare hotspotting model is our Camden Core model, which we use as a basis to start the reentry work that we'll talk about. Um, so instead of working in the hospital, we shifted for, uh, tra we transitioned to work inside the jail, which we'll get into. And we also launched a Housing First program in 2015 where we connect individuals with high use of the healthcare system who also experience a chronic homelessness to permanent supportive housing. And so some individuals that we worked with in our reentry program also qualified for that housing program, which we'll speak to in a bit. Uh, but before getting into the program specifics, I think Let's start with the data as, as everything kind of begins there here at the coalition and with hotspotting. So we rely on a robust interconnected data infrastructure to support both our patient facing and practice facing interventions as well as our systems level policy work. And we have three core data systems here at the coalition, our Camden Health Information Exchange or the HIE, which has real time data from the four health systems in South Jersey. We also have our internal performance and care tracking system, which is our case management flat platform where our care team inputs um, you know, their time and effort and work with, with the clients. And then finally, we have our homegrown database, which we've called Camden Arise, 
which stands for Administrative Records Integration for Service Excellence and includes external data sources like all payer claims data and jail data, police arrest data, and other um, non-health sectors like the school district data and vacancy service survey data. So that's administrative. We don't get it in real time, but it comes in on a regular basis. And so in 2014, by, we were able to link multiple health systems like criminal justice, healthcare, and housing, and from Camden Arise, which then set the stage for our jail-based reentry work, which we have named Camden Reset. Um, so Camden Reset um, launched in the, with the support of the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. Um, and we named the small pilot reset with the help of our some community members here in our community advisory council. And, and reset stands for reentering society with effective tools. We launched in fall of 2017, and uh, I think we enrolled our first patient, patient in December 2017, with an ultimate goal to help patients gain the skills and support they need to avoid arrests and preventable hospital readmissions and improve their well-being. So. Uh, our triage process for reset was we received and reviewed jail records, and then we prioritized individuals who had three or more jail commitments within one year. And then from there, we had that list, and then we went back and looked into the health information exchange that we run, and we were able to rule out non-Camden City individuals, and we did that because of uh, our experience doing our hospital-based work. It can be challenging when folks are uh, far away to do meaningful care coordination and engagement. Um, and since we are a small team, we decided to keep it within Camden City. And then once we had that, th that list, we then reviewed HIE, those HIE records to find folks who also had high utilization of the local hospitals. And the hospital utilization was for folks who had two or more inpatient admissions, again, within that same one year period, or four or more emergency department visits within the same year. So by the time we went to enroll someone, looking back a year, they had at least three or more jail commitments and at least two or more inpatients or four or more emergency department visits within that same year. Okay, so this is just a list of the uh, interdisciplinary uh, care team uh, at the Camden Coalition for the RESET program, which consists of Michelle Adenick, who's a registered nurse, Bill Nice, <clears throat> who's a program manager and social worker, myself, Brandon Goldborn, who's a community health worker, and also Jeremy Spiegel, who's a legal consultant through our medical legal partnership. So uh, the stats show that everyone enrolled in a RESET program had a substance use diagnosis, while two-thirds also had a co-occurring mental health diagnosis. So uh, it was interesting to note that, <clears throat> especially when we were only looking at utilization. Uh, we also found that <clears throat> we were serving mostly non-white younger men with the average age of a reset client being roughly 35 and a half years old. Um, none of this data on this chart are mutually exclusive. For example, uh, a person can have multiple medical conditions Note that all clients had diagnosed medical conditions or a mental health condition, but all the evidence of substance abuse, disorder, and abuse. So from this data right here, we noticed that the majority of people that we enrolled in the program were awaiting trial. Um, note that the offense type and charge category data are not mutually exclusive. For example, a person can have multiple offenses and or multiple charge categories. And this was, a new, uh, this was unique in Camden's context because the other reentry programs that serve individuals in the city only serve those who had already been sentenced. So <clears throat> our care team first engages patients while they're still in the Camden County Jail and offers them the opportunity to consent and enroll in the program. Uh, three of us had access to the jail at the time, um, the nurse, the social worker, and community health worker. And there we met the individuals and helped coordinate their care while they were still in the jail and continued to do so once they were in the community. So 
what we did was we helped them identify their needs and begin a sustained relationship that addressed their medical and social barriers to wellness. Uh, we've, we visited our participants both inside the jail and in the community, as I said before. And uh, what we do is customize a care plan that's centered on their goals, which could go from anything from accompanying them to appointments to connecting them to resources uh, like housing, mental health treatment, substance abuse, and legal issues. Although we are a time-limited intervention, we would like to consider ourselves linkers. Uh, we don't take the place of mental health treatment or substance abuse treatment, but we work to empower, empower our patients toward graduation where either they or someone that they have identified in their life can help them manage without us. So we have identified a few successful strategies that help ensure the continuity of care when people are returning home from jail. Uh, the health information exchange allows us to create beacon reports that we get alerted to in real time, either once or twice daily, to whether someone was in the emergency department or was an inpatient in the hospital. And this helped us tremendously with our work because in the instances when we couldn't find a client and they were hard to engage in the community due to housing instability, we were alerted when they were in the hospital and we were able to contact them there. The HIE also has integrated data from the medical and mental health provider that is inside the Camden County Jail, which works bi-directionally. Providers inside the jail can see an individual's medical history from the local hospitals and can review the basic reports from CFG on the outside. This was particularly for helpful recently when an individual was released and then we shortly coordinated for the individual to go to a mental health crisis unit due to active suicidal thoughts. We printed out discharge papers from CFG and provided this to the crisis team with the list of his most recent medications. So although the Beacon reports and CFG data were helpful, nothing replaces the coordinated care of building relationships with the staff in those systems. Um, I'm actually going to have to give a shout out to <laughs> the jail administration staff for helping set up both quarterly uh, committee meetings with relevant partners at the reentry spectrum, as well having a bi-weekly meeting directly with service providers where my team and I meet with the director of nursing, uh, the, serve, the, excuse me, the sergeant involved in the inmate services, the lieutenant who oversees the outreach efforts, and as well as the reentry liaison. Um, CFG also allows us to touch base in person to ensure coordination of the care and the med management. Relatedly, a lot of our time is spent ensuring coordinating this care with community providers once people are released from jail, um, including primary care docs, mental health and substance abuse treatment, specialty care, and legal coordination. Uh, with the consent of our patients, we share the mental health and medical records with the jail directly with mental, staff, mental health staff and substance abuse providers to ensure continuity. Just as with jail, the best strategy is consistent on the book meetings. We have one every week with the local uh, addiction medicine provider, and although it's a short meeting, only 30 minutes, it saves us a lot of time and energy from emailing to make sure we're all on the same page and working together to make sure the patient is working toward their goals. It, so what that does is helps clear things out that could get little things that could be in the gray area um, that we know are not little but have become barriers for these people. So, and one of those barriers that I know Brandon and I faced a lot uh, doing this work was, as, as we know, is housing. And so something that we spent a lot of time helping clients coordinate was their housing needs. And like I said, we have, it's a small N. We, we only enrolled 16 individuals, but six out of 16, 37%, said they were unstably housed or homeless at that intake in jail when we first met them. Upon release, one more, uh, although initially it was thought they were they had stable housing turned out to not. So 50% were unstably housed or homeless at that point of release from jail. 
And of those seven, we were able to connect three to interim housing immediately upon release, and they ultimately became eligible for our Housing First program. And like I said, we know it's a small size, but it's interesting and provides some insight in, into this population of folks who have extreme use of healthcare and the criminal justice system in Camden. So some utilization data that we've been able to, to get, like I said, we started this program in December of 2017, and reset patients as a group have reduced their utilization of the local emergency department, hospital inpatient missions, and stays at the Camden County Correctional Facility, which is really awesome and, and, and we're excited that, that it's going in that direction. So these stats show a change in number of events comparing one year pre-reset enrollment inside the Camden County Correctional Facility to a period following the release from that index jail admission. So for E, for the emergency department use, it's reduced by 61%, by inpatient admissions by 64%, and by jails and uh, for the Camden County Correctional faci Facility by 84%. Um, I just have to note this aloud. I know it's on the slide, but I have to say it or else our director of data will admonish me. Um, this is preliminary data. Um, it is not everyone, the analysis only includes counts of events pre and post reset enrollment and has not standardized for time. So the post period and the post period begins that day the client is released from the index jail admission. So one of the takeaways for us, like I said, we know it's a small cohort, but that it, it is exciting and to, you know, stay tuned as, as we, we're, we're still serving a few of these individuals. So, you know, check back in with us to see, to see how uh, things progress in a, in a few months. And so some more about the utilization rates. We, so we just, like I, didn't, like I said in the last slide, the reset cohort reduced their jail and hospital utilization. What's interesting is that the subset of, of individuals who, were, who, provi who we provided that direct housing intervention to, those three, they reduced their utilization the most um, out of all 16. And the reset subset with the highest reduction in ED use and EDU specifically was those that we connected to interim housing. So it's interesting that there's a connection between the reduction of, of going to the emergency department and getting to housing. Um, the subset of individuals who were actually identified themselves as being stable at that point, at that release from that first jail admission when we met them, um, they had reduction in jail stage, but they did not. Ha they were about the same in their inpatient and emergency department reduction. And the individuals that we did not connect to interim housing, including those who were stable, actually remained in our intervention longer. So our care team worked with individuals that uh, longer than folks were able to immediately connect to housing. I think, again, because it's a small number, we can't have extrapolate huge uh, takeaways, but it's interesting to note that there is, from, you know, from a, an agency perspective, once, when housing was an option, our care team had, had to work didn't have to work as long because we were able to get them stability. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we have been simultaneously running a Housing First program since 2015 where we connect individuals with high use of the healthcare system who also experience chronic homelessness, which is HUD defined, um, to permanent supportive housing here in Camden County. Some individuals in our reentry program, notably those three, uh, have been connected and are in the process of connecting to this housing program because they need to meet that chronic homeless criteria. And, and our Housing First program has shown to reduce utilization of both inpatient and emergency department stays when comparing two years before move-in and two years post-move-in. Um, kind of the unfortunate thing that, that we've seen with, uh, with this, though, is that not everyone is homeless enough so that because of the chronic homeless criteria, so we come against that barrier when trying to connect folks to vouchers, but we have been able to connect reentry folks to um, vouchers for people with severe and persistent mental illness. And then I know we're, we're running at the end of our time, so um, just another barrier that, that we've seen with housing is for criminal background um, can be a real challenge, both getting folks connected to state, state vouchers like we have here in New Jersey um, but also, even when the New Jersey has been pretty progressive and they've really worked with us can, and can account for mitigating factors, um, we're also working with private landlords to connect, to take those vouchers to, and so uh, that can be a challenge. 
but um, we've noticed that really an enhanced engagement with the municipal court system to help reduce some of the active criminal proceedings was key in our work, and we utilize the medical legal partnership to help influence and advocate to the court around the importance of housing. Um, since we're running out of time, I will, maybe we'll just read one quote and then, and then we'll go to the end. Okay, well, this quote comes from one of our reset clients and uh, the importance of housing and how it affected the situation. It says, the program is the light in the darkness. It's just been, excuse me, it's just been, they've been so helpful to me. And I, yeah, I feel it's so much better than I did the day that I got out. And I realized that, okay, I'm out, now what? And with my aunt not letting me stay with her, I was like, oh, might as well do what I know how to do. At least if I drink, I won't feel it. But I haven't had the urge to drink and haven't had the urge to use a drug. Having that help just strengthened my resolve. And then, this is you. Okay, so <laughs> here's, here's evidence of it right here. Um, mm -hmm. This is this particular person uh, we were working with, uh, he, this was when he graduated and, and he was moving into housing. But the interesting thing about it is he, we give certificates out, which is something that's like physical and serves as like a remembrance to show them where they came and where they are now. And they're always genuinely gracious for this. It's something to reflect on when they have the opportunity. And um, yeah, so I was actually there for this move in for this client and he was just like excited. He, he loved everything and was holding back tears. So, I mean, it was good. It was a good feeling to see exactly where he came from and you know, just to be a part of his journey and, you know, to where he's trying to be now. Yeah, and this, this is our goal, right, for everyone. Uh, and, and for him, it was definitely after about more than five years of experiencing homelessness and going in and out of the Camden County Jail, it was, it was uh, you know, it was humbling, I think, for all of us to, to be a part of this journey. But, um, and thanks, everyone, and we'll, we'll look forward to questions later. Well, thank you everyone and welcome. Thanks for coming. My name is Tara Lawyer. I am representing Impact Justice, which is a national innovation and research center advancing new ideas and solutions for justice reform. We work dramatically to reduce the massive number of youth and adults in our justice system to improve conditions and outcomes for those that are incarcerated and to provide meaningful opportunities for the formerly incarcerated as they rejoin the communities. I'm greatly happy to, and so excited to share with you guys about the homecoming project. Um, it's an innovative reentry housing model, for sure. What we thought about um, a few years ago in the planning stages was what if we could use the assets that are currently in our midst, homes that have underutilized space, and use that just like the Airbnb model to house individuals that are coming home from prison. So the housing model was something that we were excited to explore how this would work. Um, we began looking at what it would take to recruit the community house, how we would do our screening process to accept our eligible participants, and then we really thought it was important to utilize a compatibility matching tool to ensure that our participants and our hosts are choosing each other based upon needs and lifestyle preferences and things of that nature, and then really solidifying that housing arrangement and enhancing community integration. So just to start off with the community host, we recruited a lot of our hosts based upon um, their community-based activity. We reached out to the faith-based community, other social justice organizations, prison ministries, and prison-related organizations. We found that they all had leadership and role model qualities. And these are individuals that are homeowners with a suitable extra room available that they are willing to open up and Impact Justice will provide the host a daily stipend for participating and housing our participant. We provide them with a $250 deposit to take care of whatever needs to be taken care of in the home. 
and a $25 a day stipend for the participant living in their home for up to six months. So a participant can come straight from paroling out of prison and into the host home, stay there for six months, and be provided that housing cost while being able to reintegrate into society and focus on the things that they need to focus post-release. We can then talk about our participants. We're looking at a population of individuals that have served 10 plus years in a state and federal prison. And what we found is that the long-term population has been considered to have very special needs related to transitioning back into society. We're talking family reunification, reinstating all of their social security cards and identifiers and birth certificates, et cetera, having uh, to navigate the new systems, online platforms for medical care, employment, and education, and not to mention the changes in the local laws and the advances in technology. When we started this out, we looked at Alameda County because this population is considered underserved. Most of our funding that is available right now in, our, in the reentry population is serving the short-termers that are on probation and um, not parole supervision. So we had a really big need to look at how can we help these individuals. We look at individuals who um, have been deemed a low risk by CDCR, and what that means is through their long-term um, incarceration, these individuals have sustained rehabilitation efforts. They worked closely with their correctional counselors while in custody. They also took the extra steps to kind of address some of their um, underlining concerns and issues, whether it was mental health, they're in treatment, they're in care. And these individuals are definitely in need of housing. They may not have support systems out here. And so we wanted to make sure that we were providing them with that as well. When it comes to our compatibility matching, individuals that are currently in custody um, will submit an application to us. We will then look at their release date and so on and so forth. We also accept individuals that are serving life sentences in California. Um, they, get, they have to go before the Board of Parole hearings, and so we want to look at the date that they're getting ready to go before board and start matching them with a compatible host so that they could present to the board and include in their parole plans that they have a home to go home to. So we try doing this matching in custody and they usually can connect through a phone call meeting. That's our most common type. If the prison facility has the capabilities, we will do a video conferencing meeting. And if the host is interested in actually visiting the individual while in custody, they can do an in-person in prison visit. Now, some of our participants apply while in the community already released into the community. And these individuals may be housed in um, halfway houses or transitional housing programs, and in some circumstances are on the street living in their car or, or couch surfing. And so what we do is we get those individuals in a face-to-face -face meeting or a phone call meeting with our available host. And this meeting is so important to the matching process because this is where an individual can be extremely honest and forthcoming with their housing needs and with their personality types and lifestyle preferences. And both parties, the host and the participant, are able to decide whether or not this will be a compatible match for them. From that point on, then we look at our community integration, which is really a big key to this. It's not just about providing participants in need of housing with a home, but it's also about connecting them with the supportive systems that are already in place with their, within their community so that they can increase their access to their necessary needs, right? We have a community navigator, which is an on-staff person that sits down with each participant at the onset of their entry into our program and maps out their life plan. Now we're looking at immediate six months and beyond, 
but when we're looking at the six months, we want to be able to provide them with that guidance and support and connecting them to transitions clinics, which have their own community health workers, specifically addressing the primary, mental, primary care, mental health needs, and recovery services of those that are in the reentry population. We also connect them with our uh, employment providers um, and our partners in education, along with our legal, legal services and so on. Our main goal here, working with a community navigator who does in-person meetings, transportation services, and not to mention phone call check-ins, to make sure that they are staying on track and always have that support that they may need. Again, our referrals go to the employment, the housing, the education, direct services, and general assistance. Um, moving on, I wanted to share with you, when we first placed our first housing arrangement, it was with Casey, and our host here is Terry Brown, and we launched the project on August 1st with this first placement, and Casey is also our first graduate. Um, to date, we have placed seven participants into community host homes. We're on target to place 10 by the end of this month not to mention 25 by the end of this year. Um, to date, we have three completions of participants that have completed their six months successfully um, with us. Uh, each and every one of our participants are employed or also in an education, getting higher education in college. Um, two of those participants that have completed opted to stay in their host home, which is an option. After the six months of Impact Justice providing the stipend to the participant and the host, what we do is they can then go into their own um, housing agreement terms and we step out of the um, equation, out of the relationship. Um, one of our participants, which is the one that you see here, KC, has moved into uh, his own home, into independent living. And so this is really what this is about is giving our participants that opportunity to stabilize post-release and reach self-efficacy. Um, here's some more photos of our host homes that are ready and prepared to house more participants. And this is an incredible housing model that is working because we're using the shared housing um, economy and really being able to revitalize the um, economy out here in, in Alameda County, which is already having its own housing crisis, as you know. We have a homeless problem that is extremely uh, terrifying on a daily basis. We see it every time we come to work. Um, and we know that the incarcerated population coming home um, is three times more likely to experience homelessness. And so what we're doing is we're finding a low-cost solution with homes that are already in place with people that are, that are ready to utilize the social value of housing someone and providing them that support. So while we're also um, creating spaces and homes for those that are much in need of it, we're also building relationships with community members and through proxy they are showing them how to live in the community today. And we're just really proud to scale this and um, have our long-term goals um, you know, enter into other communities and other um, counties out here in California, and then definitely replicate the model and create a toolkit so that we can go and train other organizations on how to create this housing model across the nation. Uh, thank you, everyone, and I look forward to your questions. Hi everyone, my name is Casey Moyer again. I'm with the Mental Health Association of Nebraska. Destiny Camuso unfortunately is at home with a sick child so you'll be only hearing from me today. I want to talk first a little bit about the Mental Health Association. Um, we're fairly new, I, I pretty, we'll have to stop saying that soon. We were incorporated in 2001 with two of us, two peers, um, and now we have 41 peer specialists on staff. So. MHA is unique in the fact that um, we are completely peer-run and peer-operated. All our programs were developed and implemented by people with lived experience, and for us, for us, that means mental health, substance use, trauma, 
years of incarceration, whatever that might look like to each individual's story. I wanted to give you a little bit of background. Um, these peers wrote these slides themselves, so I'm not um, talking about them without them knowing, but Melissa uh, has the diagnosis of schizophrenia. She was in and out of the hospital. She grew up in foster care. I mean, just kind of had a, a rough go in the beginning and didn't have employment history. And today, Melissa's been with me probably 10 years. Um, I think one of the things that we wanted to show here is that uh, peers, we can maintain, we don't have to have the high turnover that a lot of people struggle with peer organizations. Um, she has been with me for 10 years. She's part of the management team. Um, and she is our benefit specialist, which means she is a certified work incentives uh, coordinator uh, serving the folks that come to our house uh, in obtaining their benefits if that's the goal or looking at what work incentives they might be able to use if they are receiving Social Security disability. Um, this is Amy. Uh, she had a long history as well. You can see she had 53 criminal convictions, um, has a history of mental health psychosis. Today she's fantastic. You'll hear more about her in my presentation, but she uh, is full-time with me. Uh, she's been with me for four years and uh, is, is housed in her very first home uh, for over eight years. So her goal is to um, give back to what was once given to her and she definitely does that. And then this is Dave. And I'm just giving you three out of the 45 peers that are staffed, but Dave was incarcerated for 22 years, um, came out with discharge papers that said that he would be living in assisted living with med management and all of those services uh, for the rest of his life, but that's not the case with Dave. Dave is, again, full-time peer at one of our Kia houses. Um, he lives independently. He's been in a long-term relationship, and his quality of life is greatly improved. As you can see, he likes to play the guitar. So how it all starts for us is um, we start in the inside. We primarily work with the State Department of Corrections, but we are also involved in the county jails. Um, we start building relationships as soon as we can. So we're going into all of the facilities, which I have to thank um, the Nebraska Department of Corrections for allowing people with our backgrounds into the prison system to work with folks. And we're not allowed just only in general population, but we are allowed in the restricted housing or the whole, as to say, um, to work with individuals who are struggling. One of the goals is uh, for individuals with severe mental health issues that are in restricted housing in a prison system not to be released uh, right from the whole to the community. So we try really hard to build relationships with them, help them get to general population, and then be able to have a solid reentry plan before they're released. Um, this is us also. We uh, have trained 18 uh, long-term. These guys have uh, life sentences, a lot of them. Some of them just have many years. We train them in the Intentional Peer Support Program so that they can provide peer support to individuals who have shorter sentences or who will be getting out just to help them have, uh, again, solid plans for reentry and also just teaching them how to use their time wisely. So this is our, our Hanung home. This is our transition home. Again, it's peer operated 24 seven. We have a minimum three peers on staff. It's 20 beds. Um, we work with individuals uh, within 18 months of release on parole, probation, or if they have jammed their time or discharged from the system, we will work with them also. Um, our priority is to serve people with significant mental health or substance use uh, who have those issues, um, and many of them are not wanting to, to go back to where they came from just because of, it's unhealthy for them. So we, uh, our priority, again, is those that are, are living with the significant mental health. Um, I like to talk about our house. Uh, you can kind of see the pictures there. The biggest thing for MHA is the community buy-in. Um, I think being peer-run, we had to really uh, convince the community, especially the neighborhood that we're in, that this was going to be safe and that we weren't going to um, cause problems in their community. And so we have this, this home 
It's, again, 20 bedrooms. It's got 14 bathrooms, but we wanted to make it feel as recovery-focused as possible. And we did that by getting the community involved in it. And when you get the community involved, now they have buy-in to the whole um, success of the program. I like to tell people it looks like a Pottery Barn magazine because everything in this house is just absolutely gorgeous. What we did was we put on like a recovery room redo challenge, like an HGTV challenge, and we had 15 teams of people uh, decorate these rooms and there was a competition and then we had interior designers um, judge the rooms and we had winners and press and the whole works. But the purpose in all that, again, is to get the community to buy in. So parole did a room, the Department of Corrections did a room, emergency services did a room, um, some local physicians in town. Um, and to have their buy-in into the success of the program and to knock the stigma out of uh, what we're doing is very, very helpful when you have everybody involved. Um, the average stay is about 90 days. It is not a halfway home or a group home. We don't drug test. We don't have curfews. We don't have a list of chores or things that they have to do. It's really, a, again, it's peers. So it's working for the both of us. It's people are there because they want to be. Um, parole cannot tell them they have to go here. Uh, they have to ask to come here. And uh, it's individuals who want to change their life and want to do something different and want the supports to be able to do that. We allow parole and probation for them to do the policing aspect of that, but we don't do that at our own home. This is Kia House. Kia House is a five-day stay. Um, so when people transition from HANU and they go to their own apartment, often when you're coming from a prison system of, you know, 1,500 inmates, and then you go to HANU where you're a guest of 20 individuals, and then you go to your own apartment, that can be kind of scary. So um, this allows people just to check in to Kia. They can stay there for five days, work with peers, figure out, you know, if there's some things that they need to work with or or just get that peer support, and they can keep their job and they can do what they need to do during the day and still maintain their housing. This is our supported employment. So at the house, the peers offer supported employment. We work with them on their resumes and their, um, of their gaps of employment and how to talk to employers. We've built really good relationships with employers in town. Uh, I also like to show you know, just our staff and how it's a win-win for everyone. We have hired 12 of the people that we served that have been recently released from prison. We've hired five of them that have uh, recently been in the jail diversion or drug court program. We have three individuals who are on mental health board commitments and we have three veterans on staff. And I just think it's important to show that you know, the peers that may not have had opportunities for employment because, or good employment because of their, their backgrounds are earning a livable wage, a more than livable wage, and finding purpose in the work that they do and, and giving back to the community. Um, this is another program I just like to talk about. I think one of the other successes of our peer programs is that our our relationship with law enforcement is fantastic. I mean, they come to the houses, they have coffee with the peers, they know who's there. Um, they're very protective of, you know, making sure that if people are doing things that they're not supposed to do at the houses, that they address those issues right away. Um, and it's changed the dynamics of how we interact with law enforcement and how they interact with us. And what else they have done is if they come in contact once they leave our, our transition home and are in their own services or if they are at our place and they know that they've um, been a guest of MHA, they'll contact us and let us know that they might need some additional support in hopes that we can avert any further crisis or uh, reincarceration. Um, Peer support starts right at, like I said, we are inside, but they, these are folks that are getting out, and here they are being released with their box and their coat. Um, 
And I think it's important to have somebody that has built a relationship with them, meet them right where they're at the day of. Often, um, you know, the system is not worried about or have any control over, I should say, people discharging um, when it's zero below outside or um, it's a holiday and you can't cash your check or whatever those barriers are right off the get-go. So we meet them at the door and our goal is to get them, if they are coming to our house, to, to help them get there, get the, what, their food and checks cash and whatever they need to begin their journey or if they are not coming to our transition home to, to do the same thing, just to be there and help them uh, walk alongside them as they transition to wherever it is that they're going. Um, I just have to give credit to, again, how it's done for us is building those partnerships. Um, when we went in front of our city planning to open up the 20-bed facility, not one person was there to say, um, not in our backyard, we will not have people, um, you know, with criminal histories and substance use and all of these issues moving into our neighborhood. They were very um, welcoming to us and that is due to the relationships that we've built with our neighbors, the support of parole. We belong to the neighborhood association, so we participate in their, you know, their garage sales or whatever it is that they're doing. We we want to be a part of. So we we are all about giving back to our our community. Um, the county commissioners have been great. They know what we do. Again, law enforcement. City planning department, and it, every time something came up for licensure or any of that, we had a relationship with them enough to um, work through some of those things rather than um, them just telling us that we weren't going to be allowed to do this. Um, I just want to show here the training that we do with law enforcement. So peers are involved in all new recruit training, dispatch, the behavioral health threat assessment training. So we can inform, especially all the new officers, it's pretty um, not a new thing to them anymore. It's just part of their training that we work alongside of them and that we do have these houses and that we're a resource available to them and can meet them wherever it is they need us to be. This is just a quote from uh, the Director of Public Safety. He said 300 officers can't agree on anything, but they agree on the value of this program. And that just meant a lot to us. Um, and this just shows our growth. So we started out fighting for peer to have employment, peer specialists, and it started out with them asking us to be van drivers at a community mental health center many years ago. And then we were allowed to open up Kia House and Hanu Home, and we got our uh, program with law enforcement. We're in Lincoln Public Schools. Then we got our contract with the Nebraska Department of Corrections. And we most recently have also contracted with the Nebraska Parole and Probation. I just think it's, um, we didn't grow that fast because we uh, didn't know what we were doing. I think peers are very successful in reentry and all these other areas. And this just shows by our growth that we can be a valuable asset to the other partners. And this is just Destiny's quote, and I, I show this because um, Destiny was looking at a life sentence, and for her to have been with us for eight, nine years now, actually this is old, so she'll be 10 years this December, but the people that she has tagged in this Facebook quote is a combination of peers and law enforcement officers, so that's why I show that. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you so much to all of our presenters. Um, I just personally really appreciated the, the stories and the faces that you all shared um, of people who are working towards recovery through your programs um, and uh, just really appreciate them being willing to share their information um, through you all um, during this presentation. 
right now we're going to work through as many of the questions as we can. Um, we really appreciate that uh, many of you have submitted questions already. And so I'm just going to start trying to work my way through some of these uh, questions. So first of all, um, just a question for all three panelists. You know, the first question that always comes up around this issue is funding. How do you fund housing? And so um, if each of the panelists could just speak briefly about, you know, what are some of the funding sources you're accessing within your states and, um, and communities to uh, be able to support people with housing? Um, and we'll just start with Laura's group, Laura and Brandon. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. It's also always on the top of our minds as well. So our, our Camden Reset program was funded through a research grant from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. And our, our housing work, both for Reset folks and, and our, our other healthcare high utilizer program that we're serving. So our Housing First program is, like we like to call it a puzzle piece of, of funding. So we use uh, the vouchers that we're working with our state vouchers, project-based vouchers, formerly known as Section 8. And then we have, we've lobbied and, and uh, worked closely with the state to have a, a line item in the state budget to also support permanent supportive housing for this uh, individuals experiencing chronic homelessness who have high utilization. So that's a big support. We've also connected closely um, and been supported by local hospital systems here in South Jersey, as well as working with MCOs um, and been able to demonstrate back to MCOs the reduction of utilization and cost uh, to the MCO that to, to make an argument that they should support us. So it's really, and then like local smaller foundations as well um, have been helpful, but it's really, it's a constant, uh, you know, it's a, it's a constant fight. This is Casey, and we are funded by the Department of Corrections. We also have a contract, like I said, with the parole administration and with probation for our housing services. This is Tara representing the Homecoming Project. And to start out our pilot project, we utilized private funding um, and uh, small donations that have helped us reach this point. Um, we're now attempting to secure state funding that is particular to reentry housing um, and rental assistance. Not to mention, um, as we continue to prove our model, we will then try to also secure a contract with the Department of Corrections and Paroles um, by, by securing that funding and so on and so forth with government. All right, thank you. And um, so, so there's one question asking uh, across the three groups, um, you know, sometimes individuals with more severe and persistent mental illness uh, tend to struggle the most in terms of finding and, and even um, staying in uh, housing. So there was one participant who asked, is there a special effort to find housing for clients with paranoid schizophrenia? Um, and she, she mentioned, I find these clients prefer the street to group homes. So any uh, remarks across the presenters about um, you know, not only serving individuals with paranoid schizophrenia, but maybe individuals with that more severe and persist persistent mental illness? This is Casey, and we do serve a lot of individuals with significant mental health. And I also talk about the fact that 30% of my staff live with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. So for them to be able to connect with somebody who understands what they're going through, and then we just, when they do transition into their own apartment, um, the service doesn't stop. Uh, we have peers that visit them on a regular basis. They are also welcome to come to the houses anytime they want. Um, if they have been a part of our program, they, they can, like I said, they can be at Hanu or Kia anytime they want to receive that peer support. And a lot of it is just being able to help them access the services that they need, the medication, and having those social supports. Thank you, Casey. Yeah, is, uh, do, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is Laura and Brandon from Camden. 
I think similarly, it's it's really about that support piece once once individuals attain housing. So when we talk about housing, it's not just a house; it's housing with case management support, which is crucial for everybody we're serving. I think notably for people with serious and persistent mental illness, um, that there is someone there uh, willing to work with them, build that relationship, help them with paying rent and all other needs. And so it's, it's similar. That that's a crucial part. It's not just house. It's the support that goes along with it. And Tara, I know that you noted that you don't specifically uh, provide special services towards people with uh, paranoid schizophrenia, um, but I. From our initial calls, you indicated that many people coming from the prison do have a background of um, experience of trauma or mental illness or substance use disorders. Could you just briefly um, share how you all um, uh, consider uh, an individual's mental health or substance use needs as you are placing them into houses in the community? Absolutely. The strength is definitely in our partnerships. So when we are connecting with our transitions clinics or with our day reporting centers, we are making sure that we are connecting them to a service provider that can meet their needs and that they can have the support that they need and the care that they def desperately need to transition into the most challenging part, which is after serving 10 plus years or even a life sentence in many cases, um, is a challenge in and of itself. Um, so we want to be extremely delicate with all individuals coming from all backgrounds and, and challenges and, and concerns and health matters because they need that assistance just as much. Thank you. And uh, so this question, I'm going to direct it towards um, Casey, but uh, certainly others chime in if you have thoughts as well. I think what stood out to me and to many other listeners is uh, that they have been able to get peers into correctional settings. And, and Casey, I know that you mentioned that you're not, you know, they aren't allowed to go into general housing, but they are allowed to go into some of those specialized pods. So could you describe um, just how you all were able to make that happen and how you all came to agreements around, um, you know, who can come in and where they're able to go within those correctional facilities to provide those peer support services. Sure. I think initially there are 10, uh, let me see, there are 10 uh, facilities, state facilities in Nebraska across the state. Um, and they allowed us to start with one, the women's facility, because it is the smallest. And we started um, providing wrap support groups and one-on-one -on -one peer support, and then they started allowing us to go down into restricted housing if someone was having difficulty being in general population. And they started to see the results of that. And, and now, today, four years later, we are allowed in all 10 facilities um, in, uh, in all uh, areas of the facilities. So, um, we've even done RAP on, on death row in Nebraska so that we could be able to provide them guys some support while they're there. And I think the results of what we've done has, has done us well. And now all of, um, all of the peers that work for MHA, even if they're, I mean, I have, I have peers that work for me that will be on parole for the most of their life. So even if they're on parole or they, they have done a violent crime, or they live with significant mental health issue, if they work for MHA, we are allowed to go back inside and work with the men and women that are inside. And did you have any challenges when you first broached um, uh, stakeholders to, to be able to access those spaces? I think the challenges for me was, in all honesty, was, was training the peers. Um, it's very triggering for them to go back inside and hear the clanging doors and sometimes um, seeing things break out on the yard where they may have, uh, when they lived there, um, joined in or, uh, you know, what do I want to say, get, they get protective of their, their own folks. So it was more training on how to deal with their own triggers and how to not respond to negative uh, stuff that was going on if a correction officer did say something that they didn't like. Um, it, it was difficult at first, but now, like I said, the relationship is great and the correction officers, for the most part, 
are uh, welcoming to us and they understand that we're there to help make their job easier and not more difficult. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Laura, Brandon, or Tara, any comments you want to share around um, a, utilizing peers in more of these um, settings that have traditionally been harder for peers to access to provide services? We haven't considered that at this time. Uh, we, we have definitely talked about it and um, are in communications now with talking with, with our county about what that could look like. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Uh, so one participant asked, how cooperative have you found your local HUD housing communities in assisting you with returning clients? And I'll post that to all three of our uh, presentations. This is Tara. We um, recently had a very good conversation with HUD and showing them, you know, our low cost approach towards housing and the reentry model that we are trying to, you know, scale. And we found it very supporting and encouraging for us to pursue HUD housing op uh, grants and, you know, funding options so that we can sustain this. This is Laura and Brandon from, from Camden. We, we receive HUD, HUD vouchers, but we get them through New Jersey, through the Department of Community Affairs. And so we work very closely with New Jersey's Department of Community Affairs. And they, like I, I referenced earlier, they have really, um, they have been great and are willing to look at cases on an individual basis and consider mitigating factors, whereas in the past, some, some of the referrals that we've sent them from the individuals we've enrolled in jail like probably would have been denied a voucher because they are considering that they are, they've been chosen to enroll in an optional program like us and are um, you know, getting connected to services that um, you know, they're they're open to that, and so we've we've been able to successfully connect, like I like I mentioned, three people to these housing choice vouchers, which which is huge. One one person even got accepted to the voucher while he was still incarcerated, which was phenomenal. And like we we actually weren't expecting that when we submitted his application from jail, we were kind of assuming it would get flagged and then we'd have to go through the appeal process. But we were willing to like start. We thought it would get appealed anyway, so we figured oh, we might as well start the fight earlier. Um, but then we got accepted and we were, it was amazed and then we were able to use that. He was pre-trial, he got, when, so when he was uh, released and then went in front of the judge, we were able to use the fact that he had a voucher to support his um, probation and not to be sentenced back to the jail and so we were able to then connect him to the housing, so that was huge. I think the bigger issue we have isn't necessarily with HUD or, or the state, it's actually with the private landlords that we work with. So. A voucher is only as good as the person willing to take it, um, and so sometimes that's where the added barrier is. So even though our individuals that we're serving have passed a criminal background check from the state, private landlords often have their own background checks that, that they that they want to run, and then they're not willing to forego those standards. So um, you know there are a few folks who, are, who have vouchers, but it, it's hard to place them in housing. And this is Casey with MHA. Uh, we really don't work with HUD vouchers. Um, we, we do have peers attend realtor association meetings, landlord association meetings, and Amy especially has built really good relationships with private landlords, and so they call us when they have a, a place available, but we, we haven't worked much with the HUD vouchers. Okay. All right. Uh, so one of our participants said, uh, many presenters talked about clever ways to get buy-in from all the providers. I have run into divides between the way the jail law enforcement is run county by county. Do you have any suggestions on working with jails that are resistant to reentry services? And that'll just go to any presenter that would like to respond to that. This is Casey uh, this is with them, I say. Okay. So I just wanted, I think our, again, our biggest thing was building the relationship with the police officers, which then 
gave us some validity with our county jail. And we have just recent, we've been working with law enforcement since 2011 and um, again, involved in all their training. So it helps because we meet the new recruits before they even, you know, hit the streets. So they already know who we are, but our relationship with the officers then um, gave us the validity that we needed to um, work in the county jails and in drug court and all the other specialty courts. So that was how we, having the backup of the law enforcement officers got us into a lot of, I think that's what supported the Department of Corrections as well. And I'd say for us in Camden, I think a helpful strategy is always to start with data, is to look at like the evidence base across the country, you know, what Casey and her team are doing and things proving or showing that there can be a positive impact of reentry services, both on reducing folks inside the jail and perhaps also cost-effective strategy. Um, and then with that, I think there's uh, what we've seen in our county too, is there's real, um, there can be real support when other peer relationships across the county jails and or sheriff's department are, are made. And so connecting local county, connecting counties with each other so they can learn and share stories from each other. And, and I know some counties, like I'm sure Cam, I could talk to Camden County, you know, would be happy to share their lessons learned and their process in deciding to have reentry programs and the why behind it and what they've seen as, as uh, positive to help the case. And then also something I learned from Middlesex County up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right, right outside of Boston, I met, I met with um, a few individuals who are running a jail-based reentry program there as well. And they actually, they took a public safety approach and reframe to this work that, you know, they're, at least from folks who are going in and out of the jail, they said for, to, to at least do reentry services for folks who are, had a lot of use of the jail because from, from a public safety lens, it was maybe they shouldn't be going back and forth, back and forth. Like maybe they sh something else could be going on. Maybe they should be incarcerated or maybe they should go to prison or maybe they should not be. But from the sheriff's department, like from a public health lens, public safety lens, it was, it was worth their time and energy and money to give a closer look and to provide services to those individuals. Okay, thank you. Um, just uh, one other question, a theme that's coming up out of the many questions being submitted is housing for people with a conviction of a sex offense. And so um, is that something that you all have been able to address in your work? Uh, if so, would you describe that? And this will go to all of our panelists. This is Tara out here in Oakland. and. This is one of our challenges right now um, with the housing model and with a lot of the special conditions and criteria for individuals that have sex offenses is being in the community and near certain um, locators and, and things of that nature. And that's at this point in the pilot phase, we cannot house individuals that have sex offenses. And it's a challenge that we continue to look at um, and, and find ways to um, make sure that this program can be for everyone. This is Casey and we do house people with sex offender backgrounds and again, that, that all went with uh, educating our landlords and our realtor associations and all these places as far as they are the least to recidivate. Um, they, uh, and, and the backing of law enforcement coming with us to the meetings and showing the neighborhoods. A lot of people didn't know that they already had uh, many sex offenders in their neighborhood. They just weren't aware of it. And so decreasing the stigma around um, people's fear about having folks with those backgrounds in their, in their neighborhood was something we worked really hard on and now uh, we have been able to successfully house quite a few people with sex offender background and the neighborhood association where our Hanu home um, hasn't fought us um, serving that population at our house. And, and similarly for, for us, we 
our vouchers, the HUD vouchers that come to us for, via the state of New Jersey, there is the stipulation that the only two things that will absolutely deny someone is being is having being on Megan's law and being convicted of producing methamphetamine in public housing. So we can't use those vouchers to to serve folks who have a sex offender history. But we you know we've worked with again that's where we kind of get scrappy working with some private landlords if people do have an income or connected them to some type of emergency assistance or other funds to support um, just like private landlords and, and other individuals in Camden who are willing to work with them but that is a constant challenge and struggle that we face here and yeah there's more work to be done around it all right thank you uh, we've had a couple people ask about data so, um, and I think that Casey has, has spoken to the fact that, you know, the outcomes they've been able to produce and the, uh, the track record they've created over the past years has opened doors for further work. So, would you all describe um, either, you know, what you're doing now or what you plan to do around um, data collection and what are some of the key um, indicators or key things that you track through your outcomes uh, uh, data to ensure that you're able to demonstrate the success of your program. And so this question is for all of our panelists. This is Laura again from the Camden. Uh, we, as we highlighted in our slides, there are a few key metrics that we were looking at. We were looking at utilization of the emergency departments here in South Jersey, as well as inpatient stays. And we were, we were able to track that information by, because we run the health information exchange. So, and like Brandon mentioned, we got those real time alerts when it happened. We also, it, that health information exchange that you use can um, also connect to our internal case management system. So we can see that like when we're care planning and, 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 and working working with individuals and then obviously also obviously the jail stays and showing that as a, an outcome we were hoping for was a reduction of jail stays and we have that because of our agreement with the Camden County Jail to access to look at that data so we can show that there has been a reduction um, and then we also from a quality improvement lens we know that in real time because of our our connections with with the Camden with Camden County so um, you know we would know if someone if someone does go um, or got uh, picked up for something that we could find out pretty quickly. And then um, we also, we look at wellness and the self-perception of wellness. I, we didn't share out those findings because the last, the wellness survey we did at enrollment and then a few other points throughout our work together and then finally at graduation and we haven't graduated everybody yet so we're still collecting that data but it was important to us to have have a wellness metric and, and self-perception of how folks think they're doing as well because it's not just about use um, and something else and then other metrics that we're looking at too are connection to housing and connection the uptake of certain referrals uh, as well, like housing and transportation, uh, income, et cetera. And this is Casey, and we have the University of Nebraska Omaha tracking how many people we serve, um, how many programs they were in, so did they accept sort of, uh, supported employment or outreach or RAP, or were they in our transition home? And they track all of that. They look at recidivism. They look at employment, transitional transition to stable housing after leaving our program. Um, and those, right now they're looking at, the, they're compiling the three years, the last three years, and I, I don't have the data on that yet. They're just looking at it now because um, we were initially awarded our grant in February of 2015. So we're just, like I said, looking at the last three years of data. And then we also do what we call a quality of life attainment scale. So we look at when they first come into our service, the quality of life stuff as far as um, we're looking at housing and transportation and employment, but we're also looking at their um, community natural supports, their physical health, their how they feel about themselves. Do they feel like they have a purpose? And then they, they complete that scale when they leave our program or within 30 days, every 30 days. I um, mean, we look at those results as well. 
This is Tara here, and much similar to the other presenters, we look at, um, well, we're currently very still much in our baby stages, um, so, but we will be collecting um, our data through our internal research team um, that will be looking at the outcomes of community integration, and that includes employment, transportation, how well were they able to um, build that self-efficacy. We're going to be looking at the utilization of our referral systems and how they did with connecting with the resources that are currently in place with our partners. We're also going to be looking at parole condition compliance, um, how well have they um, maintained the contact that they needed to maintain with their parole agent, along with the recidivism rate, et cetera. Um, also, we want to know their, incre um, you know their social relationships health and was there an increase in that, one, in that uh, respect. Um, not to mention, we are going to be doing something, the self-perception of their success. Um, not, and also next step tracking and um, whether or not they completed the program and so on and so forth. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we've had a couple of kind of follow-up questions to the data question. Um, so one person was asking about how do you overcome uh, the barrier to data sharing as, as many agencies are in silos and maybe will say, well, because of HIPAA, we're not allowed to share this with you. So, um, you know, if anyone could speak to that um, issue. Also, someone else asked, um, you know, are you using authorizations uh, to release information about patients. Um, so if each of you could just share what your uh, current practices are or plans are around um, ensuring that you have the permissions and the agreements to share information and describe what that looks like. Um, this is for all of our panelists. I can say that for the practices of impact justice, we aggregate all of our data so that we can share it publicly. Yeah, at the coalition, we, we definitely hear that, that um, a lot of agencies and systems are traditionally siloed and that in order to do this work effectively, we, we need to start breaking down those silos. And you know, we've done that both with the healthcare systems here and with the jail by, I mean, like everything else, it starts with the relationships and it starts with rapport between two people at two of the agencies or two of the systems. And, and it, because it requires trust when you're entering, it, entering into these data relationships, but it also requires lawyers. And uh, part of that can help with the trust and also the, the anxiety that actually what we're doing is legal and HIPAA compliant. And we have formulated, we have BAA agreements with the local hospitals here in South Jersey and with the jail um, and to, to ensure that we're doing everything um, up to par. And when, at least on the healthcare system side, whenever anyone enters in, goes to an emergency department or become, has an inpatient stay, they, you know, all the releases and, and forms that folks are signing into those hospitals when they go in, there's also a release form that um, to have their information shared with the health information exchange, which we run. So that's how we have access to that and know um, that it's being protected. We have a team of folks that run the health information exchange. They do audits frequently. And if they have found that providers are using that um, inappropriately, there are real consequences. And then to the like specific patient level, we also, whenever we meet any, anybody, the when we're talking about the program and they say, yes, I want to work with you, the first thing we do is sign, is we have them sign consents. And they're fairly, it, it's, a, it's a quick two-pager actually, but it, it's extensive and, and it does cover a lot and we take our time going through it and people can opt out at any point. Um, and I know that the, the stories that we shared on our, um, during our section today, we also have a separate consent, a media consent form when they're okay with us sharing stories. Um, and yeah, so that's how we, we cover ourselves. This is Casey, and we're um, really similar to the last individual. Um, it, it does help also because we are peers, so we don't collect any behavioral health clinical information, uh, HIPAA protected information, and they do sign releases when they come in for us to enter into the UNO a database, but we're not um, giving them any identifiable 
information besides the criminal background. So I really don't have that much more to add. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and so one last question. We're starting to get close to the end of our uh, time. Um, we've had someone ask about families, and so many people coming out of prison and jail, they have families. Um, and so uh, if you are able to accommodate families in the housing that you link people with, could you describe that? If not, um, how do you support them in reconnecting and reunifying with their family upon release? And this question will be for all of our presenters. This is Tara from the Homecoming Project. This is one of the exciting things that we um, have put into the housing model, which is the family preference. And an individual whose family member is the homeowner of the home or has permission from the homeowner can house their loved one coming home from prison into their home and Impact Justice will provide them that stipend to house them so that they're not experiencing a deficit in the household income. Um, not to mention, the main thing is we're connecting our participants with the community navigator. So they'll be in the, their family's home and they'll still be given and provided that extra added support that they need to transition back in successfully. Um, I think that this is really one of the challenges that we're seeing um, all the way across the board with the reentry housing pro, um, project, projects uh, wide scale is, is that people are not being able to connect with their family in some of the traditional housing programs. Um, and so we really want to encourage family reunification um, by getting people to connect with their family, spend time with their family, um, and structuring that into their life plan. Um, because it's an issue that we're not necessarily addressing. Um, so the family preference option is something that individuals can utilize um, through the homecoming project, but we still would screen um, the family host as if we would screen any other host, making sure that the home is inspected and is suitable for living and making sure that they are compliant with parole conditions, making sure there's no weapons in the homes, no drugs, et cetera. Um, and if they get qualified, then they, we will definitely support them housing their family member coming home. This is Casey, and we, we do, um, families are definitely allowed to come to Hanu Home. They're welcome anytime. We don't have like um, certain visiting hours or anything like that, and they're definitely free to um, visit their family wherever they may be. Uh, of course, that's if parole is okay or probation is okay with that. We do have um, a lot of supervised visits at Hanu, so if the Child Protective Services is working towards uniting uh, children with their parents, um, we have a um, small park and uh, play area in the back of Hanu home and try to provide a space, a safe space for them to reunite with their families and work towards getting back home together. And, um, and interestingly enough, um, I haven't had the opportunity to actually connect anybody with their families. Most of the people that I've worked with um, were connected to their families or they identified people that they would have as um, supports in the ones that were actually connected to long-term housing, um, most of them, actually all of them, were only looking for one-bedroom vouchers. So I never even had the opportunity to, to do all those things. Yeah, and there for our, our housing program at large, which it serves folks who do have criminal backgrounds but maybe not as extensive as, as our reset people, they, for when they wanted to get connected to family, it's a conversation that we have to have with the state to alter, uh, to change vouchers or to switch vouchers, and that's actually happening now, um, which is exciting, but it, it takes time and, and a lot of connection and coordination and uh, patience, which can be really challenging. All right, thank you. Um, so just again, want to thank all of you, um, Laura, Brandon, Tara, and uh, Casey for your time today and sharing um, all your three programs. Um, again, 
you know, I just am really struck by the different approaches that you all are using and, uh, you know, the, the effectiveness of the different types of services you're providing to the community. And I know that uh, some of our listeners also um, expressed thanks. So we had one comment, thank you for the work you do in the community. I thank you for your time and consideration regarding those um, that are equal to us all. And someone else said, um, thank you for all so much for your devotion to improving our communities. Um, so I, 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 not just here at the Gain Center, but also our listeners are really appreciative of um, the work that you're doing. So thank you for sharing that with us today. And uh, just so all of our listeners know, you are welcome to join our listserv if you haven't done so already. We will be sending out emails through this um, listserv when we have the slides ready for release, as well as when the recording is available on the SAMHSA YouTube channel. Next slide. All right, so that brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you so much. If you have any questions or would like to follow up with us regarding any of the questions related to today's presentation, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, the GAIN Center, we have our email, uh, our website, and our phone number listed here on this slide, and we are available for any phone-based um, technical assistance or consultation as needed. So uh, please do not hesitate to utilize us as a resource. Uh, thank you so much and have a great afternoon.